so great to see for the first time in a year and a half people in this room. Uh, it's also great to see, uh, you know, the masses on the Zoom. And uh, my, my name is uh, Rosan Jagalov. I teach at the Russian and Slavic Department. Uh, it's very well you and I'm really very happy to be moderating and it's first, very first hybrid event of the Jordan Center. I mean, it's still a two good and better experimental version, but so there may be a few issues, but I hope and none of them will detract from uh, the, from the intellectual uh, uh, experience we're going to have today. And there is no better person to give us this experience and the last year, called back at the Jordan Center, uh, to whom I owe a number of very stimulating intellectual experiences and conversations, some of which took place in the, in the most authentic of Ukrainian interest in this village speaker, which already introduced me. Uh, Dr. Rushkovsky was born in Uzgorod, a uh, West Ukrainian city at the very border of Slovakia and in close proximity to Hungary and Poland. You can, you know, it's really probably a great place for uh, post-colonial scholars to be born in. <laughs> and you can imagine how many different states and uh, changes in, in different points in modern history. Uh, from this uh, periphery, his trajectory and uh, irretrievably took him to, to the imperial metropoles for St. Petersburg, where he completed many degrees at the European University, European University there, then to Washington, where he got his PhD uh, from Georgetown. Uh, Dr. in history, importantly. Uh, Dr. Ryszkowski has published essays on numerous topics, ranging from the history of late imperial education to the history of late Soviet intelligentsia and Soviet philosophy. Uh, a volume of published writing uh, by the late Soviet his, uh, historian and philosopher Boris Porchnev that he is co-editing with Artyomi Magun is forthcoming from the European University Press in 2021. But, his, but uh, Dr. Rykowski's main concern has in one form or another been the place of Russia and the Soviet Union in relation to Western imperialism and colonialism. Thus, his book project Soviet Occidentalism, Medieval Studies and the Restructuring of Imperial Knowledge in 20th Century Russia, explores the role of medieval studies and Soviet appropriation of Western culture in the constituting and maintaining of the empire after 1917. We are all very lucky to be getting a sneak preview of it in the next hour and a half or two. So we we'll are take it away. Uh, thank you, Rosen, for this kind of introduction and Sasha now now you'll start sharing the screen so yeah. uh hello to everyone uh i'm really thrilled and honored to be here today and have an opportunity to present something that i was working on intensely for the last year here at jordan center but uh, in fact uh what i'm going to talk about uh is a result of almost almost 15 years uh, of stubborn pursuit of one topic. So um, in order to justify this miserable ta task, I basically came up with this monumental title. Uh, and definitely I wanted to drag more people in the audience. I think we did well in this department. So uh, I throw the big concepts of modernity and empire, which uh, probably everyone would agree with me in the last 30 years played a quite important role. Uh, in thinking about Russian history uh, comparatively and globally. And initially, uh, my, my general idea was to present a certain uh, historiographical reflection on the issues pertained uh, to these two subfields, and at the same time to reflect on characteristic lack of dialogue uh, between them. And then to introduce my own engagement predominantly with uh, decolonial thought of uh, Latin American thinkers in order to uh, redress this historiographical mission. However, when I would start piling up my uh, slides, uh, it just turned out that this historiographical presentation of different uh, structural arguments in the field didn't fit pretty well with this engagement in presentation of my contribution with 
uh, the colonial uh, theory uh, on the back of my mind. So basically, I decided to start this talk, uh, this discrepancy, historiographical in the sort uh, providing me with a good starting point for today's presentation. Because presentation and representation of uh, historiographical arguments and debates is usually governed by a spatial metaphor of the field, right? We're all bridging gaps, filling gaps, cultivating our plots. And the field here refers to a quite disembodied and abstract experience of space. That uh, does not necessarily imply that it exists somewhere in a vacuum, like a social vacuum. But at the same time, this field is governed by some internal logic. And this is probably even more pronounced in the field of Russian and Soviet studies, given its origins in the Cold War and the long-term history of ideological quarrels. And there are certainly significant benefits uh, in this position. I mean, professionalism, professionalism, organization, and structure, which it gives to the field and eventually a steady supply of uh, new arguments. But at the same time, its benefits, they come with a certain cost. And particularly, uh, these uh, costs that pertain to neglect of space and position external to acad academia uh, as productive sites for generating new arguments and perspectives. In turn, uh, Latin American thinkers, the colonial that I will talk about uh, later today, uh, provide quite different epistemological model for making arguments. Actually, the source is not in the field, but in one's fully embodied position in space grounded in specific racial, race, ethnic, gender, class. Uh, experience. And theories, methodologies, and interpretations eventually, they are articulated results of this tension that exists between uh, reflection and experience in research in the process of scholarly activity. So Walter Mignolo, one of the key uh, representatives of this decolonial trend of thought, actually called this nexus between experience and reflexivity the locus of enunciation. And in short, the experience behind the argument uh, it is a part of the argument itself. And it's very difficult to actually uh, disentangle and present one without the other, let alone seamlessly incorporate it in certain uh, historiographical, well-structured field of discussion. So therefore, I decided uh, to start uh, to structure today's talk, actually, and to start not with historiographical debates, as I planned initially, but rather with my own changing locus of enunciation. Rawson already gave you some highlights uh, in that regard in terms of my academic trajectory. So I, I will have to repeat him a little bit. But uh, basically, gradually from this locus of enunciation, I will move to elimination of certain blind spots and discrepancies in the field. So eventually, I will have time to talk about lack of dialogue between modernity and imperial paradigms in the field. And uh, to conclude, uh, uh, and, and and basically, my uh, my search in negotiating this tension between academic engagement and personal experience, eventually the result of uh, this negotiation condensed in the third and the most obscure probably concept in this monumental title. So Soviet occidentalism that I uh, will explain today, and I hope to conclude with some remarks on the decoloniality and Occidentalism in the field of Russian Soviet studies and the practical benefits of taking the colonial detour for participants in the field. But uh, before I will proceed to my locus of enunciation, let me give you a very, very short introduction of space and time with uh, which I'm dealing uh, as a researcher. So uh, it's, it's difficult to find the place more distant from the imperial peripheries than central district of Moscow. But that's exactly uh, where my research is located. And it's uh, between Alexandrovsky, Stad, Kropotkinsky metro station, Bolshaya Nikitka, Yahotmiria. Basically, these are institutions, Moscow University, and later in Soviet time, uh, different uh, academic institutes, translating and publishing enterprises, so on and so forth. And uh, time frame, it's basically late 19th century and going through the whole 20th century. And I'm interested in people who are populating this landscape. So uh, medieval is people working and researching medieval West as a, as essential uh, representation generally of the West 
And uh, I'm studying these people from the late 19th century and through the 20th century. It, it seems that they really, really very distant from any major concerns of people dealing with modernity and empire, particularly with empire. But actually where I pick up this topic and why I decided to study it, um, the, the trajectory basically and the stages that I went through, they helped to erase many memories. But the place and locus as Rothen already mentioned, uh, actually Transcarpathia, the, the region where I was born. It's on a border with, uh, currently in Western Ukraine, on a border with uh, Hungary. And it's basically perpetual, per eternal periphery in different colonial and imperial formations. It was part of Austro-Hungary, later it became part of Czechoslovakian Republic, then again of the Hungarian kingdom to end up eventually as part of the present day. Uh, Ukraine after spending almost uh, 50 years as part of the Soviet Union and Soviet Ukraine. And actually, uh, colonialism and imperialism was hardly an alien topic to me as I grew up in the territory. I went to school during the first decade of Ukrainian independence, and basically our textbooks, uh, historical textbooks, they were framed by anti-colonial uh, mindset. It was a story about the valiant struggle of Ukrainian nation against different imperial encroachers, including definitely Austro-Hungarian and uh, Russian Empire. But uh, as I moved uh, to the university, actually, when I started study, my studies in the university, uh, the topic of post-colonialism and a more refined intellectual discussion about postcolonialism in Ukraine became one of the most hotly debated topics within the academia. So basically the context uh, when I started my studies. And this is the books uh, that I, I had in my library, they're all in Ukrainian. And Edward Said, let's say, was published and translated in Ukrainian 10 years before the, of the Russian publication. And basically I encountered Said for the first time uh, in this Ukrainian annual. Discussion was revolved around the issue of mental and cultural and economic emancipation definitely from Russian domination with a whimsical um, picture, which is quite interesting for, for, for all who are acquainted with post-colonial theory. The final horizon of this emancipation actually uh, led not to provincializing Europe, but to recentering Europe. Ukraine getting rid of Russian domination wanted to join Europe. And generally, I didn't have any problem with this very, very specific position uh, of Europe and on uh, Ukrainian mental maps. But I occupied a peculiar position as a descendant of Russian settlers, uh, as a representative of the legacy of, let's say, white collar, middle, uh, middle range Soviet intelligentsia, completely steeped in the imperial mythology, habits of mind, and definitely cultural hierarchies, where Russian culture, cosmopolitan culture, and Moscow were on the very top of the position. So I definitely wanted to contribute something into this ongoing discussion about Ukrainian post-colonialism. And my response was suggested not so much by theory, but rather by the environment, the material vestiges of the empire that which did not disappear by that uh, period. So in early 2000, there was no, almost no internet, very bad knowledge of English, but uh, my Ukrainian speaking teachers, they taught us and they wanted to present us with the Europe and definitely with historical account and cultural account of Europe. Most of these publications that they assigned us, they were in Russian. Because, so I spent a lot of time in the former uh, Episcopal Palace, where the library uh, was located, basically reading assigned literature. And that was the first time that, that I encountered the major protagonist of the study that I'm presenting uh, today. So uh, reading this Soviet medievalist and their presentation about the medieval past and about Western civilization, I immediately found other references to key intellectual figures of the uh, Soviet humanities. I found references to Lotman and Spensky, Tarpus School, Horowitz. So basically that was my intellectual package. And at some point I realized that these figures, Bakhtin was definitely part of that as well, 
uh, these figures, it's a quite interesting research subject that can uh, personalities and figures who are recognized in the West, not keeping a clear imperialistic position toward the uh, peripheries. And uh, I wanted just to use uh, these people and research on them to make a very simple uh, point. If we're learning about Europe from these Russian sources, probably Ukrainian post-colonial turn and pass towards Europe should lead through the East. So that's very post-colonial and post-imperial geography mantle. Uh, my point was that joining Europe, we have to go through the uh, center of this European civilization with which located in my weird imagination in Moscow. So I wanted to basically live up to, to the, and I, I wrote my master thesis in Ukraine, which was about Bakhtin and basically the legacy of Bakhtin in late Soviet intellectual tradition, uh, but not just only talk about things, I wanted to do something. So the next move was definitely to go to the East in my search for Europe. And uh, I chose for that the institution as already uh, that uh, Rosen mentioned, it proudly displayed Europeanness in its title. So European University was appropriate uh, context and place where to continue my search for that. And, but the imperial connections of this study, both of materialist and of Bakhtin, they pretty much disappeared once I uh, moved to Russia because it was quite different intellectual context where these imperial connections or imperial concerns or post-colonial concerns were irrelevant. And uh, you had to deal with completely different structure of intellectual discourse and debate. So uh, uh, medievalists that I already picked up in Uzhgorod in Western Ukraine, they actually were quite prominent in internal Russian debates. It was the period of transition from Putin to Medvedev uh, with intense uh, discussions about the potential harbingers of Stalinism over the corner. And so Russians, and especially this liberal segment that I was uh, hanging out with, mostly uh, the, the issue of forgetting high with the Vatican German, or coping with the past, with the Stalinist past in the Prussian Russia was quite important. And Medievalists, it turned out, were the, among the rare representatives of academic field who wanted to talk about the Stalinist past in early 2000s. And that is why it combined somehow reflection on intellectual brilliance with this engagement, the traumatic past. So while writing quite professional social and cultural history of the discipline, the discipline of medieval studies, and it's that I tried to combine it with this more politically charged and uh, relevant agenda of coping with the past in the uh, Russian uh, present. So this was a broad framework how I uh, worked with this topic in Russia, and it was quite exoticizing narrative. It's brilliance and tragedy, uh, which is common when we're talking about Russian 20th century culture. And almost accidentally, I. I got with this topic to the US, I actually didn't plan, but it just happened how it happened. And I was pretty shocked when I got to, to, to the field, right? In, in, in Russia, it looked pretty different. In the US, the field turned out to be uh, dispersed almost on multiple islands, which had particular specific discussions. And you just had to come with a certain argument that would fill the gap or will have to bridge certain omissions or redress them. And to, to, to learn like almost second year of my graduate studies that uh, actually history of disciplines and social disciplines is something that should be neglected and completely irrelevant. The high day of this kind of research definitely passed was uh, not very encouraging. And having this uh, very Russian kind of narrative about the brilliance strategy, brilliance and trauma, it, exporting to the US uh, discussions, which were centered on completely different topics. It was quite, quite difficult. And actually the imperial topic, I never quite forgot about, about my uh, Ukrainian background. So empire was constantly on my mind, but it, it, it somehow disappeared from the mind that it's possible to do anything 
related to medievalist and empire. So searching for topic, searching for, for relevance, eventually, uh, I spent almost five desperate years in the academia. And uh, since I decided to do this long-term 20th century, basically, story, there was a quite uh, condensed and shaped narrative about the brilliant Soviet uh, scholars who accommodated and adjusted themselves to the totalitarian context, and they found the niches in the system to continue to thrive. And then I had to write a chapter, since it was a long-term project, about the imperial beginnings of the medieval studies in Russia. And this is a standard kind of narrative uh, about the almost biblical, as we say, as they say in Russia. So the, the, there is a founding father usually to some disciplines who has the first generation then the first generation producing second generation. And this story goes on and on up to all our times. So it's a common place that the founding father of the tradition that I was exploring in the Soviet time was Pavel Vinogradov, Paul Vinogradov. And usually when he is remembered in Russia, people uh, noticing that uh, his book written in late 19th century actually won him uh, European recognition. And he got the position in Oxford in the early 20th century, exploring European and British medieval past. This is his most important. Oh, I didn't switch there. No, no. Sasha. Oh, this is Vilnius in England. I got here. Uh, this is most his important book on medieval uh, history, but it's much less often remembered in Russia. And let's not uh, analyze that he was a professor at Oxford. Corpus Christi College, and he occupied the position in comparative law, uh, which was previously occupied by Sir Henry Main. Uh, Nagradov came to Oxford as a self-proclaimed disciple of uh, Henry Main, eager to update Main's uh, version of comparative historical jurisprudence. So I start digging into this connection between Vinogradov and Victorian savants. This is Henry Main. Uh, he was actually an ardent uh, advocate of the comparative evolutionist, but at the same time, he was a successful colonial administrator in India, uh, whose expertise and intellectual energy now is credited to justify the model of indirect rule in uh, British Africa. And as well, some uh, experiments of imperial administration uh, in India. So he was famous as with his own version kind of, of modernity traditionalism uh, distinction, which he framed as status to contract in general was a very, very conservative uh, thinker who stressed the importance of tradition and inertia uh, in realizing a progressive projects. That is why he criticized very, very actively this liberal approaches of British administration in India. Uh, and. To add to that, he definitely was arch racist as well, uh, thinking about the miracle of British uh, freedom as a unique, uh, unique historical phenomenon and European freedom as well. And so, despite this fact, Vinagrada still was uh, eager to continue updating his uh, legacy because by the 20th century, Henry Mann was not so popular anymore, even as an intellectual. A prominent figure. There was too many uh, intellectual failings and in inaccuracies in his uh, in his words, and so that's basically what uh, uh, Opus Magnum that Vinogradov produced in his travels between Calcutta, Oxford, and Moscow. Uh, he he left Russia in 1903 because of some political tensions that he had with the Ministry of Education, and. While well, he considered main individualistic conservative in his own age of globalization, and Vinogradov often reflected on the new global world basically built by uh, capitalism by the 20th century. And so his idea was that this new uh, world required more reflexive intellectual approaches to understanding historical reality. And so for him, he wanted to produce this new account, updated account 
uh, as we call general jurisprudence for civilized humanity, and which stated his major word that all modern Oasian historical forms and combinations were clashes, and they contributed to understanding and imagining the general course of social evolution. So basically, uh, this epistemological relative, uh, relativism, the faculty of his empirical analysis, Vinogradas, and the focus on uncovering plurality of causes and complexity of social intercourse, and his aversion to preconceived ideas. He argued a lot with Marxists and with sociologists of Durhamian school, uh, basically recently led to rediscovery of legacy uh, as some intriguing contemporary parallel to Marx Weber's empirical sociology and even innovative departure from Eurocentric forms of historical evolutionism. Uh, here are a couple of examples of this uh, historical mindedness, as he called it, that uh, open uh, the open ended questions that supposedly had to show there is no linear developments, uh, civilizational developments, and actually. Um, it's better for historian reflexively to uncover this multiplicity and relativity of historical forms. But uh, you can think about it as purely intellectual result, interesting uh, and uh, whimsical kind of uh, development of main comparative evolutionism. But at the same time, Vinogradov was hardly a scholar in the ivory tower. And that's for me was the most surprising. To, to learn, he always seen his explorations, comparative explorations, medieval explorations, as a part of this project of uh, building and creating understanding of history for a civilized humanity. And that meant embracing relativity of his own position in the course of evolution. And for Russia, there was a place in this grand scheme, because when he's talking, uh, it's, it's a certain development of the combined and uneven uh, theme Marxist, but in liberal key. Uh, in Russia, there was a backward peasantry for sure. There was a modern capitalist economy, but the most advanced part probably of this quite uh, uneven development was the Russian educated class. And that's what he had at some point, reflecting on this uneven, development and multiplicity of temporalities that mixed in Russia, he's telling us that the cultivated Russian of today's in his ideas, not behind, um, um, not behind a cultivated American or Englishman, but in fact, and hardly to his advantage, he's some such in advance uh, for the league. So basically his comparative jurisprudence and this relativistic epistemology, it's a sort of Russian gift to civilized humanity to which he belonged as well. And this reflexivity and understanding of history is crucial for some practical applications. He imagining the global world of global empires and the certain path of progress. And actually, while spending a lot of time in Oxford, in Calcutta and in Oxford, he never forgot um, about Russia. He's commenting on Russian events. He's engaging in Russian events. In a certain way, he is replicating and remains Owen trajectory. Uh, not a scholar in ivory tower, but, but rather engaged uh, politician uh, and intellectual. <laughs> so actually, he is not a only scholar or historian in Russia who is thinking in that direction. He's providing a certain intellectual blueprint for practical applications. Almost every university in Russia, and I just put a couple of them, had a historian who was part of, of the circle, was partially uh, led by Vinogradov. Uh, this is a historian he organized in already in late 19th century, a uh, circle of imperial historians who tried to con transform the study of history in a real science and to draw a practical conclusions from uh, this fact. So this is a historians in his uh, circle, actually the key leading Russian liberals like Pavel Milukov, uh, the leader of Kadyat, 
or Alexander Guchkov, the leader of Octavius, they are disciples of Vinogradov and they are participants in these circles. Um, so I discovered to myself that there is a certain imperial network of people who are eager to transform uh, empire along the liberal lines, which are quite reflecting what all these people thought about the presence of British Empire in the world, and they consider British Empire as a certain model for the development of Russian Empire. What did it practically mean, right? This a, a dream of the liberal empire. Uh, this actually quotation from Vinogradov's uh, pupil, Alexander Salin. So that's how they imagine the world. The world is the basically combination of great empires that have the right to move where they want, annex, conquer, so on and so forth, and establish a civilization along these patterns. And definitely they're reflecting on the backwardness of Russia, but there is a weird logic that actually imperial goal will help to overcome Russian backwardness. So this uh, Russian nation somehow possesses this imperial trait that will help despite backwardness to move towards imperial uh, libertas, so the freedom and imperial. Um, at this point, we're coming to this common historiographical uh, body of literature, the Russian modernity before 1917, the power of experts. So basically, these historians that I'm talking about, who were led by Vinagrada, they put in certain claim, their expertise is expertise on historical mindedness. Their knowledge of history should be put in practice and transform the empire. So this is the claim for power. The most interesting thing that all their uh, reflections on expertise are tied to the framework of the empire. So here modernity and empire actually coming very close together. And uh, the familiar thing, uh, 1905 was definitely a shock for them, the revolution. And so they coming up with uh, different ideas how to manage diverse population and how actually to transform this backward empire in certain modern uh, version. So all the talks about the rule of law, certain point they shifting to this necessity to apply numerous forms of social tutelage and course of pressure. If you're thinking about the Russian peasants, they coming up with their Owen uh, solutions. Usually it's as a people who are very attuned to history, they want to prescribe an enormous quantity of time for all these subjects who are not fully developed to join civilized humanity to which they certainly belong. And so for Russian peasants, it's just certain literacy tests which, which people practiced in the United States. And he is very well aware what does this uh, literacy test means in the in the U.S. context. Or for Jews, for example, oh, oh, going back, that's, that's, so so for, for Jews of the Pale of Settlement, congested atmosphere somehow created uh, conditions that again need time. So you need time to finally join uh, the civilized human kind, and it's something some something that quite remind uh, Depeche Krabarty's idea about this waiting room of history to which all colonial subjects are prescribed by the educated and progressive elites. Eventually, Vinogradov was uh, part uh, of, the, of the leading scholars, scholars who consulted uh, the, the board, which was responsible for organizing League of Nations. And so he basically coming up with the same solutions for this problem, who is going to be represented in this body, coming up with this civilized, half civilized, different categories that would definitely make access to any decision making problematic. So that's imperial internationalism. And I spent quite a lot of time researching in Agradov and this uh, imperial threat of medievalist research, because this temporality is why medievalism is so important for them. What happened in medieval Europe and medieval England is something that's happening now in Russia or happening now in, in India. And this comparative evolution is, this is the model that uh, allows them actually to reflexively and nicely dream about their liberal 
utopia. I finished this part of dissertation, chapter one, chapter two, and I just thought it's all about empire. That's something that I wanted from day one when I started researching medievalists after I came to the United States. However, the narrative that I was planning to construct further. So that's basically the field that I was talking about in the beginning. Uh, uh, on the right, there is empire and modernity. And basically that's something that I was uh, discussing and exploring in uh, chapters that we were dealing with uh, pre-revolutionary right? liberals and their, uh, their applications of their liberal rhetoric to modernity. And prior modernity, that was all nice, but when I switch to 1920s and 1930s, that was a narrative about intellectually brilliant scholars and the art of survival and accommodation under totalitarianism. So how it's possible to relate to this different narrative? And that for me was the biggest question and issue basically. All about empire, it's while moving to 20s, medieval is just irrelevant to the question of expertise, to the questions of managing borderlands and former imperial territories. That was very challenging, and I basically tried to figure out uh, what kind of major differences I can identify as we're moving from the imperial to the Soviet period. And that's uh, major lines, divergences that I noticed while exploring them. So first it's contraction of imperial cultural space. Um, this is not only related to revolution and civil war. I show you the network of imperial network, the network of universities from Kazan, Odessa, Derp, uh, to Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Tomsk, where all these people were present, the intellectual elite. Uh, this network basically disappears in uh, 1920s. And this fact is not only related uh, to the effects of civil war and revolution. So I'm moving to the second one, it's concentration. And they are related, concentration and expansion of the model cultural institute in the theater of socialist experiment. Most of the scholars that I was talking about, eventually they concentrated in Moscow. There were institutions built and uh, developed uh, specifically to host this kind of research. Third, it's transformation of expertise uh, into aesthetical practice. Expertise before the revolution, not applied expertise at all when you're doing Middle Ages in Soviet circumstances. Uh, it literally has nothing to do, to do with applied practice. And fourth, uh, that I noticed is conspicuous presence of Jews within the modal institutions and among the new cultural elite. Again, it's quite difficult to bring this very different observations to a certain interpretation that would help to make this transition from uh, imperial to revolutionary uh, and post-revolutionary Soviet Union. Supposedly all of these features, uh, they related culture, super, super structural phenomenon, right? And it's very difficult to interpret this constellation of facts unless we take seriously what culture actually and science meant for the Soviet project and for victorious Bolsheviks. Because importance of culture actually is directly related to the transformation of the imperial space in the aftermath of the revolution. So I just quickly, I will make a couple of points. It's certainly that the Bolsheviks who won the revolution, they were anti-capitalists, Staunchly anti colonialist, anti imperialist, whether they were anti Western, I doubt that they were anti Western. Actually, most of them uh, either recruited from the subalterns of the empire or representatives of Russian intelligentsia from this revolutionary underground, were pretty much Eurocentric and a couple of. Fine studies, let's say, uh, 
recent Pace Healy's book, really excellent, about the exiles in the West, showing that uh, how deeply all these revolutionaries imbibed the fascination with the West, both in the revolution underground and in the exile. So they are fascinated with the technological achievements of capitalism, and at the same time, they're looking for a complete appropriation of Western culture. Right. They're fanatically devoted, devoted to the Enlightenment project uh, of bringing culture and science to the masses. And when the capitalism is out, there is no market. And that's the reality they're achieving by the end of the 20s. And co communism operates basically as a very distant horizon, almost a religious belief, as uh, Julius Loskin recently showed to us. Uh, the most tangible material signs of this transition and moving forward the communist idea is rapid industrialization, turning the backward peasant country into industrial one, and it's cultural revolution. Uh, unlike how industry, culture actually can be individualized and subjectivized. For Bolsheviks, and that's my strong claim, culture both a tool of rule a medium of power and a ground for experimenting with new imperial distinctions. So the culture, when the market is out, is a constitutive to a new type of Soviet uh, government mentality. So let me try to explain what I'm talking about here. There are some couple of paradoxes related uh, to, to Bolshevik obsession with culture, right? So first question, what kind of culture do you want to build? Actually, in 1920s, there were multiple discussions about abolishing science and philosophy and culture as a kind of bourgeois invention to exploit uh, toiling masses. This is a pop in uh, 1920s. And different utopias of productivism, which never made explicitly the point about the connection between capitalism cultural canon, Western-oriented cultural canon, and different colonial projects. I at least never uh, seen that. But they came pretty close to make this connection between imperialistic drive and high culture. Second, this project eventually did not realize itself as a bottom-up. It was very, very heavily uh, top-down, enlightened project. Uh, and this is another paradox. The, the Bolsheviks, they want to bring culture to the masses, the high culture, the canon-oriented culture, but at the same time, they're limiting access to this culture. And it's related directly to my point about the contraction of imperial space and expansion of the elite uh, culturally refined institutions. So basically, in my material, this, you can see it very, very clearly that between 1970 and 1922, the Bolshevik expanding the network of institutions, educational institutions, cultural institutions, all around the former imperial space. By 1922, they're revoking all their decrees, the, the departments of uh, social sciences, so-called HONE. They were planted all around the provinces in 1918, 1920. By 22, they all closed down, and all these institutions who, which are responsible uh, for the production of the revolutionary progressive cutting out knowledge, they basically concentrated in one space, in more. So here I'm trying to, 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 to think about how this drive to enlightenment and spreading of the knowledge eventually was filtered through a particular Bolshevik ideological mindset which was marked by obsession with hypercentralization, at it is one control. And uh, a semi-conscious solution to this tension within Soviet enlightening ag agenda was a decision to keep orally autonomous and rarely predictable knowledge on the party ideological control through spatial concentration and surveillance. So this meant that as early as 1920s, basically, Bolsheviks were pursuing a highly hierarchized version of cultural revolution they supported Marx cultural campaigns, but preferred to bring to the periphery only strictly controlled and prefabricated ideological knowledge. By the end of the 20s, 
they had successfully eradicated the diversity of cultural and intellectual life in Bitcoin as a matter of security. And so unintentionally creating some structural disparities in access to knowledge and information, which eventually will serve as an important foundation for establishing the imperial identity and framework of the Soviet project and the creation of new imperial elites. To, to the poster that was that viewed this image. Oh, actually, uh, Katerina Clark and Michael David Fox impressively show how uh, this uh, 1930s uh, drive to basically intentionally construct and present Soviet superiority to the West and to the world, uh, which affects it had on, on the transformation of uh, the landscape. They didn't want to reject the West, they wanted to affirm the West. And so this goal was realized partially to turning uh, Moscow into a showcase. Showcase city uh, where privileged institutions supposed to demonstrate this superiority were concentrated. It's expanded the Academy of Sciences, expanded Moscow University, Moscow model schools, museums, theaters, public houses, and translating enterprises, which were responsible for producing world-class culture and science, which eventually would incorporate and transcend the best achievements of humanity understood predominantly as achievements uh, of the West. And this poster, I think, nicely uh, reflects this idea, Patlin's sculpture with Lenin on top, and basically to the right of this statue, you have nothing. It's only to the left, buildings representing images of European culture and European modernity. But so it's tried quite consciously to, uh, to tell it. And so uh, here I'm coming to this like a niche narrative for, for elite scholars, institutions, coming back to my own uh, medievalists. Usually when you talk about them in 1920s or 1930s, it's about cultural survival in the framework of totalitarianism. Well, uh, what I try to, to say and demonstrate that this niche, intellectual niche was part of some broader framework. Actually, the niche that was created for them, and it's quite explicitly discussed in party documents. They're not in, they're not interested in medievalists anymore as experts on practical knowledge. They're interested in them and these connoisseurs of old medieval documents who can show that Soviet ability to master these diverse sources related to Western history. And most of the disciples of Vinogradov eventually, they ending up in this niche with this part of the formidable edifice and construction, which I define as part something I call Soviet Occidentalism. So it's institutions heavily policed ideologically and largely funded, uh, and elites that were supposed to serve them. So I argue that these institutions of Soviet Occidentalism were crucial for generating basically a new type of imperial relationship between the center of the global revolutionary experiment and its former imperial borderlands, now Soviet republics or Russian provinces. The obsession with control leads to almost complete destruction of the independent cultural institutions in the republic, and Ukraine is an interesting case. Everything related to the West, research, translation, publishing, by the early 30s was shut down, Mostly they were repressed, the people who were responsible for them. Or the elite institutions like Oriental, uh, uh, Oriental uh, Institute with all of its collection was moved uh, to Moscow by 1935. So peripheries, they're turning uh, basically into these reservoirs of national specificity while the elite cosmopolitan culture which is supposed to be superior to Western analysts. It's concentrated in the center. And so eventually the Soviet commitment to spreading enlightenment and culture, when coupled with this Bolshevik obsession with limiting access to information, 
unintentionally turned the ideologically generated desire for culture and knowledge into a foundation for new imperial distinctions and hierarchies. So this desire was crucial for maintaining the new imperial hierarchies reproduced through the vast and hierarchically organized network of cultural institutions sponsored by the Soviet state. With exclusive cosmopolitan and exquisite culture concentrated in imperial center and its diluted nationalized version spread around imperial peripheries and uh, Russian provinces. Uh, and here uh, I would like to get to the last observation that I meant on that slide, on that slide related to transition from pre-revolutionary to post-revolutionary period. It's relationship between the overwhelming presence of the Jews in different institutional corners of the Soviet Occidentalism. Uh, and the general construction of the uh, modern edifice. So there is a famous thesis uh, about the communal apartment made by Yuri Slyoskin. And supposedly this empty corridor and common facilities, they belong to Russians, while separate apartments only the nationalities, uh, national republics uh, could get. So uh, the point that I want to make, and there is again the disparities in, 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 in narratives. There is a Jewish narrative, which mostly is concerning uh, students who are doing Jewish history, or let's say doing the, the, the studies related to the rise of the Russian uh, nationalism in the 1930s. So, uh, the central space of this Soviet project, it was marked as non-national in the empire of nations. And it was not just uh, accidental. It was maintained conspicuously cosmopolitan and international by the chauvinistic regime. So it immediately creates very strange dynamic between repression and privilege for the people who occupy this uh, central forum. So to emphasize that otherness, uh, it, it's, it definitely was not intentional, but when we don't have a national box or national room to go, and that was the case with Russian Jews, what are you going to choose? And we're choosing uh, the cosmopolitan culture with a Russian accent. And uh, I, I don't want to say that there was only Jews among the elites who con constituted uh, the central uh, part of the Occidentalist complex. But Jews allowed regime to mark this central place as a space for otherness. So it additionally symbolically even imparted this uh, function of otherness to this cosmopolitan elite, which was fulfilling very important task for the whole Soviet project. And so it, it, it created basically a weird dynamic when the elite is constantly punished. And at the same time, almost each phase of the punishment is accompanied by enormous infrastructural expansion of different elements of this Occidentalist complex. Because we are talking about highly hierarchical uh, cultural project of Soviet enlightenment. Another problem which is created, uh, this situation creates for historians that this elite located in Moscow mostly and St. Petersburg, the complex situation with two capitals. Uh, yeah. This elite most creative, most vocal, it provides historians with the narratives that eventually we can tell. And these powerful narratives, uh, the, the, the historiography usually trying either rebuke this narrative or confirm this narrative. While my point is, is that these narratives and this elite rather should be incorporated in a larger totality of the Soviet uh, project. Um, actually, I will just quickly share with you some ideas.
So basically, we have the same structure of the field, either we're talking about 1920s or 30s or post war. There is empire, there is modernity, there is all the tenuous connections between these two south fields. There is culture and power, which is usually the niche narrative, which is located in Moscow. And there is transnational in the West or the East, which basically operates on its own. It's very difficult to see this connection. And so when we're moving to the war period, and that's what I'm finding in my materials very, very finely. This uh, Occidentalist elite brought up in the models Moscow schools. So it's not a matter of some privilege, class privilege. It's a matter of place of birth. If you was born in Moscow in 1920s or moved to Moscow, and use this curative example, emphasizing the imperial themes. There are subalters who got there, but they happened to be in the place when all these institutions were erected. So you go through this model, Soviet schools, you're finishing uh, university, the institutes, you're enrolling in the uh, academic uh, institutions. So during the war, most of them going to the periphery. And this is important, and they share among themselves the, the, their letters where they're talking about the backwardness and almost colonial distance that separates them, refined product of Soviet enlightenment and people, Soviet people from the hinterland. But at the same time, this is one part of the narrative. Second part, during the war, it's the first attempt of the Soviet state actually to reach out to the peripheries, real evacuation of the major cultural institutions, Academy of Sciences, museums. So this is the first time when these institutions are reaching out to the periphery in different uh, national republics and two Russian uh, periphery as well. And this institution is not completely re-evacuated back to Moscow. So there is a certain connection uh, which is created during the war. The narrative related to late Stalinism, a classical example of this. Anti-Semitism is a key word when we're thinking about uh, late Stalinist ideological campaigns. And we have numerous narratives by the people who suffered and were punished, representatives of this elite during the, uh, these campaigns. At the same time in the narratives, it's quite uh, interesting to notice that they escaping the punishment by going to the peripheries, occupying position in different provincial universities. Universities which are in fact a part of the new uh, expansion of cultural institutions and educational institutions, but funded by the Soviet uh, state. And definitely uh, most uh, crucial for that, if you're reading the documents, party and arguments from that period, can be some decree on the philosophical discussion, but at the same time, next document, it's about opening and founding of the uh, society for the dissemination of political and scientific knowledge. So basically the infrastructure and the institutions are promoted by the state at the same moment as the cultural elite is punished and it creates two different narratives. Despite the punishment and repression, it doesn't change the structure, very hierarchical change the structure of, uh, of the Soviet enlightenment project. Uh, and we can move definitely to the talk again. A thaw, we again have a couple of different narratives related to the subfield. Uh, there is a narrative uh, about coping with trauma, right? Denis Kozlov's very good book about uh, Noe Mir. So it's an attempt to work with Stalinism, to cope with Stalinism, and eventually the creation of multiplicity. And, uh, out of monolithic and uniformic uh, Soviet cultural universe. One narrative, second narrative is opening to the West. Eleanor Gilbert book uh, about how Soviet enlightened project eventually became democratized and supposedly contacts with the West, bringing plethora of this high culture, which most of people were deprived before to the peripheries. And counter narrative of Benjamin Crowley let's say talking about the universities and expansion of the Soviet intelligentsia. 
The point is that all of these campaigns, yes, we're talking about ideological campaigns of late Stalinism or about the fall. It's a top-down campaign, despite the massive participation uh, of the Soviet population. Top-down campaigns that are increasing and buttressing the position of the cultural figures and institutions who are controlling basically the terms of the debate. It's through Ilya Ehrenburg's uh, discussion of the Western art that the Soviet audience learn about this art. It's through the filter of the Novi Mir who is implanted and located on the very top of this hierarchical Soviet pyramid uh, that uh, Soviet population eventually trying to come up with its objectives uh, about the past, traumatic past. And eventually broad expansion and production of the books with which I started in the beginning of my talk. So it's it's key, key volumes that were produced as part of the Soviet project uh, related to the history of civilization and world culture. Even during this engagement with the West uh, in the context of Cold War, additional resources institutes are, are created. So the infrastructural base for this top uh, on top institution is created and basically the books that I encountered while researching and exploring this topic in my Ulgarat library. This is a long-term result. Now you're not aware of the imperial connections, cosmopolitan connections. Uh, behind, and uh, you're not aware of the structure which is behind these books. Gurevich, Lotman, Averyansov, or uh, Bakhtin's explorations of, of the humanists, it's basically the product reflection and result on the institutional construction, which I'm proud to uncover defined as Soviet accidentalism. So I'm coming quickly to the, very fast to the conclusions. The, the travel, the time for the conclusion. Okay, so first point uh, that I want to make is Occidentalism. And um, actually when I come up with the concept of, of Occidentalism, I definitely uh, model it after Edward Said uh, Orientalism. Only later I figure out that there exists the whole trend of thought, uh, where Occidentalism as a concept is very, very uh, finally developed its Latin American decolonial uh, tradition. And I will just, and for me, it was most important. This is a key representative of decolonial thinking. So basically, Occidentalism for the colonial thinkers is probably part of the, their broader take on colonialism, modernity, and imperialism. A certain perspective on world history, which stresses interconnections and mutual dependencies rather than bounded entities placed in comparative taxonomies. So if the relationship between colonialism and modernity is the core problem for both post-colonial and Latin American studies, the fundamental contribution of Latin American studies is to recast this problem by setting it into a wider historical context. And uh, this is definition by Fernando Coronio, the anthropologist who was a professor at uh, New School. So, Occidental is an analytical category that refers to representation of cultural difference framed in terms of Western political epistemology. At the same time, it's a very broad understanding, the second definitions related to a certain perspective on the world history. And eventually, the, the most interesting concept that they suggested to me as a representative, uh, someone who's working on Soviet and Russian history, Coronel suggesting the idea of the strategic post-colonialism. It means that while discussing and exploring uh, this uh, very, very neglected part of the rise of the global world, I mean, 
Spanish and Portuguese empires, it's something that the colonial thinkers are most concerned with. Russia uh, basically provides you with material that which related to the third point, that there is no bounded entities. And basically Western modernity in a sense, it's not something which is produced in Western Europe. So the classical narratives of modernity that we have, Kant, Hegel, Habermas, uh, Anthony Giddens. So the, the miracle of modernity is it is produced in Europe, post-colonial thinkers, decolonial thinkers, Latin American, they rather stressing the concept of transculturation. So basically the mutual effects and the mutual dependencies between the peripheries Caribbean, India, Africa, and Europe creates a certain transcultural trans exchange, which eventually is congealed both in material reality of the global capitalism and in the conceptual framework that produces the key notions for modernity, citizenship, uh, freedom, liberty, so on and so forth. So uh, my point and take uh, on that and Coronel's idea of strategic post-colonialism. It doesn't mean that only Latin America can bring reflection on coloniality of power, but actually each region in the world and scholars and thinkers who are coming from these different parts of the world can provide this specific certain perspective and definitely the making of this modern world through the process of transculturation necessarily should include Russia. And I think it's something that uh, it's not always uh, fully present uh, in the field. So uh, it definitely implies bridging the gap which exists in the field between 18th century explorations of 18th century, 19th century, and 20th century focus on Soviet development. Because uh, from the perspective of this global perspective of world history as it was advanced by uh, the colonial thinkers, uh, it's impossible to understand the further developments with, without going to the origins, uh, without going to the origins and the foundations of this colonial uh, encounter, including the Russian context. And I think that there is something to think about for scholars in the field, bridging the gap between 18th century, 19th century, and further development uh, in the Soviet period. And I, this point is uh, directly related to um, the lack of conversation and actually engagement between scholars doing modernity and scholars doing empire, which in my uh, opinion is related to the deeply ingrained Occidentalist vision and certain Occidentalist bias within the field. Because we used uh, to think about Russia and the West as a separate unit of analysis and the powering figures in the field, let's say Mark Ryev or Martin Malley are usually presenting the view of the relationship between Russia and the West as a certain spread or borrowing of cultural models, political models from the West. The decolonial perspective basically helping you to open it up to different readings to see Russia as part of the multifaceted and really, really diverse global patch. And uh, I don't want to, to, to make me sound that I'm talking only about scholars who were based in the American academia, comparing them or making distinction to scholars, native scholars from Russia, because this Occidentalist bias actually is not something characteristic for American academia. While talking about Occidentalist Soviet elite and the origins and development of this elite, Yuri Lotman, Boris Uspiansky, or Viktor Zhivov, all super, super exquisite scholars, but at the same time in their studies, they partially reproducing the same kind of binary Russia and the West without trying to open uh, this box to uh, different 
uh, readings. And I think that engagement with this literature is crucial. And the Soviet period, which is not completely present on the maps of the Latin American scholars, that's for sure. What happens to the idea and the connection between modernity and coloniality that they call one cannot go without the other in the context when the structures of capitalism are not existing. There is no market in the Soviet case. And so the whole literature that was mostly based on Foucauldian models of relationship between power, knowledge, and expertise actually need to be re uh, reconsidered when we're applying them to Russia. It's kind of different type of power that operates within that system. And definitely I try to underscore and emphasize that culture is crucial uh, to understanding this type of power. And my final point, it's uh, what does it mean occidentalism, decoloniality in the field, like in, in the future developments, because I could show the, 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 the patchwork, different pilots and, and different uh, corners of the disciplinary interest, modernity, empire, culture, power, or transnational connections. Actually, this model factors feels so tightly that it's often very difficult to get to new questions and perspectives and interpretations through the filter which is created in the field. And so the colonial, uh, I'm definitely not calling for the colonial revolution in the sense that Walter Mignola does, because academia is hardly the best place to launch any kind of revolutions. But I think that there is this definitely the need of, for overcoming fragmentation and lubrication in the field, which is a certain uh, occidentalist technique in a sense that while losing the broader, deeper picture, I'm just trying to fill in the empty spaces within uh, small subfields. We're losing ability to see these mutual dependencies and connections which are running actually across the globe and which invites us to rethink the, what, what do we mean by diversity while talking about the developments in the field? Because is the word diversity simply administrative category that should be applied? And eventually when we come to asking new questions, the structure of the field to a certain degree uh, constrains us in asking these new questions. Or rather this diversity should proceed we could come up with new pedagogies and uh, new types of handling this different intellectual impulses, which would come rather from spaces and locations to which scholars who are trying to negotiate the distance between experience and broader intellectual idea uh, should contribute. And basically, Soviet Occidentalism is my still very, very not refined and uh, raw attempt basically to think about these questions and maybe to ignite kind of discussion about this. I'm not sure that I did a good job in terms of launching it on or orbit right today, but I hope that in the future uh, we'll get to this conversation but uh, more efficient way. But for now, uh, thank you. And I hope to elucidate and explain many things because it was too packed for all this. Yes, it was really an extraordinary packed talk with many different levels and, and themes which our questions can start to uh, get out. Thank you so much, uh, Bovadi. Uh, it made me aware to what extent everything that I loved about Moscow, the extreme concentration of writers and intellectuals and archives and, and academic institutions, you know, in my case, the Institute of Oriental Studies, you know, were essentially a colonial product. So, for the purposes of the QA, 
ultimate starting thing will be starting with the in-person questions and then move to the questions further afield. So, um, and the, for virtual participants, if you could indicate uh, the, uh, uh, the interest and function and their attention to exactly what are the reactions, if you could raise your hands uh, and I'll, I'll call your name, but, but first starting with uh, anybody in this room, if you get questions. Um, Hi, that was really wonderful talk. So Rich, thank you very much. Um, I have one remark and then one quick question. The remark is just that um, you can definitely see similar pattern in their 19th century antecedents to a lot of these patterns. For example, the question, are we gonna teach, are we gonna treat peripheral places as sort of static repositories of values or culture or localness or whatever, or are, are they going to sort of develop as their own bases? So there are debates about that. You know, I was thinking about a specific debate in the 1870s, but there are multiple debates about that and the same kind of push and pull. But then my question was actually about a specific moment. I'm just curious, you say it's around 1922 that this intense recentralization starts. Are they, um, are they like very conscious and self-conscious about it? Like, are they writing about it? Are they saying, yes, we need to recentralize and this is why, or is it just kind of happening institutionally? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can immediately. So uh, thank you for, for this 19th century parallel. And uh, actually, I thought about it like quite carefully, went through your book, and there are multiple insights to talk about this dynamic between peripheral places and the center back like then. And for uh, 1922, uh, there is no much reflection. It's like uh, Bolshevik exigency. And th that's why I'm talking about the lack of communication between different subfields. Stuart Hinkle wrote a perfect book about specifically these issues. They trying to control intellectuals. They putting them on the on the boat, sending them away from Russia. They they repressing them. They killing some of them. But all of this is happening in Moscow, and it's supposedly about narrative about Moscow intellectuals, brilliant intellectuals, and power. While when you carefully reading what they're doing, they're actually repressing everywhere. They're repressing, let's say, this local development of local intellectuals. By the late 20s, it's completely eradicated. And it's basically this provincial intelligentsia that, say, Catherine Yevtuchov is writing about 19th century, which completely erased. And it's erased for what reason? And you have just reports of, of, of Chekhov. It's a race because it's dangerous. You have to control it. But at the same time, you have a facade. It's the most advanced state and project oriented on promoting science and culture. And they're just putting funding, they're opening institutions for people who are in Moscow, who have multiple opportunities now, but it's strictly police. So they left it only, it's, it, it's, it's implicit, but there is this logic of spatial concentration because it's just much more convenient. You cannot control them in Vyatka. You cannot control them in Vyat, but you can control them in Moscow. Thank you, it's fascinating. So, you, yeah, I think I have a very quick question. I mean, I have a couple of comments and thoughts about the talk, and I think I'll share them later probably. But I'd like to hear more on the differences and similarities between the the earlier liberal imperialists that you were talking about and say like Soviet imperialists that kind of like replaced them in the 20s, right? It's kind of like your main argument that they are continuing the same political tradition of like thinking and practice as well, right? Like that everything that's happening in the 20s in, you know, Soviet socialist uh, socials and you know, thinking processes and philosophies and such, it's kind of like a new step, right, of that earlier liberal imperialism. Is it like, right? Did I hear you correctly? Is it your argument or are there any, you know, like differences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. 
thank you. It's just showed how 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 badly I constrained yeah. everything. <laughs> because now uh, the point is that basically what we have in 1917, it's literally the elite is completely changed. Right? The people who had positions, had their ideas about the imperial, about the liberal empire, not liberal empire. They're not anymore in position of power, or they, they cannot even claim this power. Vinogradov ended up as a Sir Paul Vinogradov, British citizen. And most of his uh, disciples basically uh, followed in his footsteps. So my point is that uh, there is a radical break in terms of understanding this in different imperial formations and different uh, imperial models. Basically, what I presented for before 1917, it's, it's the people intentionally this elite, they intentionally trying to frame what's happening in Russia after different examples of successful empires. They want to make Russia into British empire, which will join basically this selective uh, club. What Soviets trying to do, the Bolsheviks, I, I try to emphasize it. It's, who is leading the revolution? It's subalterns. If you look at Liliana Riga's book, uh, who is constituting this Bolshevik elite? The Balkans from the borderlands who will completely imbibe Occidental centric vision of the world. That's how they are imagining the transformation. It's a very hierarchical model. There are different nations. There is this path towards modernity, towards future. And at the same time, uh, the weird thing that you really want to spread knowledge, and that's that's what they saying. That's what they doing to themselves. Again, referring to Yuri Slyoskin's book, obsessively reading, obsessively worrying on their own self. They can want for communists to arrive, but while they are waiting, they are working on themselves. They are building themselves as cultured persons, which is tailored completely after the Western Bildung, let's say, this German uh, model. And the, the, the paradox is created by this tension. You want to spread culture, and at the same time, it's a matter of security and control of information. When there is no market, culture and information becomes a sort of exchange value. And like we're thinking about the Soviet project as a certain new model for symbolic of exchange. This is enormous there. This is the only way to hold conspicuous consumption without facing any problems. And, uh, and it's a gradual project. So we need to think about it long-term. They don't have resources in the 1920s and 1930s to reach everywhere. But with the Stalinist campaigns, with the thought, it's, it's both discussions about Stalin, but at the same time, it's infrastructure that goes almost to every village. The Makulture, Klumber, the Mapianera, libraries, it's circulation of enormous circulation of periodicals. And it's basically the, the hegemonic image that the state, the elites, they want to project. But the, the funniest thing is that they're sharing it with the subjects who are created in the process of this very, very weird uh, enlightening effort. So I didn't answer it completely. But I just wanted to fill the gap of my own presentation. Yes, yeah, so both of them they do share the ideas of enlightenment. Yes, yeah, that, that that's absolutely concepts and words. Yeah, that's absolutely just the landscape completely changed. Uh, you don't have even Ukrainians or Ukraine before 1917. And then you have the whole republic with the communists actually who in 1920s, I didn't talk about it, but it's just the whole thing of research that you can do. What doing Ukrainian uh, Commissariat of Enlightenment in, in 1920s? They're doing basically the same. They, they want to have showcase institutions. They want to get rid of Moscow and build their own Europe. Head with Moscow, the European Europe. That's Nikola Khrushchev. And just by the end of 20s, early 30s, guys, it won't work like that. It cannot work like that. They're raising it in a similar way, they're raising this middle middle layer intelligentsia in Russian provinces, basically equating Samara to Kiev or Tomsk uh, to Kharkov. And 
This is just really paradoxes that you want to disseminate as much as possible, and eventually it creates very, very hierarchical structure, which was quite efficient in keeping Soviet Union together. And about disparities with empires, that's another moment. I, 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 did, I didn't have time to go in that direction. People doing some interesting research on peripheries and the center. Now. And I have in mind Artemy Kalinovsky's book about Tajikistan, where he actually solving and gained one of the major points of decolonial thinkers that culture and materiality, superstructure and base, they interrelated. And that's exactly what Malinovsky showed me in the book. Culture is not something about dances and books. This is basically the foundation of allocating resources, economic resources in Soviet context. They're making decisions where to build a dam or where to put the factory, just analyzing what is the level of culturalness in that other area. And for that reason, they're creating the, 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 the whole new layer of intelligentsia, national intelligentsia, which are nicely connected into this very, very pyramid-like and tight structure. Because you now will have in Dutanbe or in Tashkent, uh, the publishing house Progress, or the journal Inastrana Literatura, because the most precious knowledge and the aura of the West, it was always concentrated in in St. Petersburg and Moscow. And I think that this, this dynamic, the West, it's very important for understanding even the model of political sovereignty and how it works in Soviet countries. It's about people, it's about party, but the light of the West was constantly operating as a shadow to anything they tried to do there. Um, just maybe, it's the and you know, maybe that kind of structure contributed to the dissolution of, of the Soviet Union. This, uh, uh, this kind of uh, local professional, uh, you know, you're from, from the Republic, you can only be, uh, you know, intellectually a professional Ukrainian or Tajik as opposed to, uh, to having uh, some investment in, in universal. Um, you know, the Soviet. Uh, no, so anyway, mm -hmm. sorry, apologies for this meaning this intervention, but now we hear. Yeah, that, that, that was quite to the point. Uh, but now uh, we're turning to, to our uh, to questions uh, online and starting with Andrea. Maybe Sasha can uh, go get Andrea. Hi. Yeah. Thank. You. Thanks so much, Vladimir. Um, I just had two quick clarification questions. One was to do with you said how you were talking about Foucault and Russian power and saying that um, Russia uh, that Foucault, uh, Foucauldian analysis is is not really applicable to Russia. And I was just wondering if you can clarify what if if you meant because um, you know Foucauldian power. Analysis mm -hmm. of powers is power as, as something insidious or pervasive, as opposed to as a gr grand events or whatever. And, and you're saying that was not applicable. Anyways, I just want you to elaborate on that. And then the second question, already touched on it in your last answer, but um, thing about which you which you kept repeating about the uh, the the elite was punished at the same time that infrastructure was expanding and and so were you presenting that as saying elite could not um take advantage of the, this expansion or i wasn't sure what you were saying were you saying that, that that was a paradox or a contradiction or um i mean it wasn't a cause effect but it, it seemed like you're presenting that that these sort of op, um opposing like centrifugal and centripetal like on the one hand the elite acting or, or sort of and is like a centripetal force and then infrastructure was expanding which was like centrifugal or no sorry i got those mixed up the first one was centrifugal the first second one was centripetal but i just was want to make sure that that's actually what you... i hope that i got it <laughs> is, 
Is that clear or is there something that was not clear? I mean, the first part was very clear about Foucault. The second part was a little bit less, but I will try to answer quickly. Uh, so uh, Foucault, that's a good question. I just really was bad with my timing. Uh, uh, no, definitely I'm not saying that uh, Foucault is irrelevant. And multiple scholars proved that the, the Foucauldian paradigm can be successfully and fruitfully applied both to Russian imperial case and to uh, Soviet case. I'm just uh, trying to say that Foucault is not enough because important dimensions uh, of the power relations, imperial dynamic in the Soviet context just simply cannot be detected using Foucauldian tools. And the, the, the division between uh, empire, I think, and uh, modernity is quite characteristic uh, of this misapplication because you can think in Foucauldian model about power, it's something that even on a micro level, but can be easily applied to a certain problem. It's experts who are executing this power. They're coming up with the, with the discourses. And uh, while looking at this materialist, you just cannot associate them with any kind of power if you're looking at them in the framework, in the Foucauldian framework. They're not experts on anything. They're not controlling anything. They're not applying, they're just completely irrelevant and unimportant when you uh, frame them in that way. And then you're looking to a different understanding of power, different structure of power, different structure of governmentality, because nowhere in the world, I think, uh, the importance of culture was so important, both to the process of subjectivation, there was a whole Foucauldian trend of research on Soviet subjectivity, which talks about communism and building communism while the practical materiality of this process of making oneself is, is directly related to Soviet infrastructural projects related to making out of person a cultured person. So uh, that's uh, about Foucault. And second question, it's uh, this uh, tension uh, between the repression and privilege in the center. Uh, I think what I wanted uh, to show that there is a historiographical disparity. There are multiple narratives and scholars who are showing us this terrible tragedy of Russian intelligentsia. That's how it's called. Zhivaga's children, if we're talking about top people. And this is a narrative if you open these books, if you open Denis Kozlov's nice book, or Eleanor Gilbert, there is not a single time empire is even mentioned in these books. So it's a kind of separate narrative which ask its own questions and filling its own gaps. And the same happened to the narrative of, of the Jewish elite. You have multiple Jewish accidental elites. I, I, I tried to make this, it's not ethnical uh, definition who they are. It's mostly the symbolical uh, aura of otherness that is so important to have in the construction of the Soviet project. So there are separate narratives. And my point was that when you're reading the memoirs or reflections of the people, horrible depictions of the Stalinist campaigns and uh, the pressure that it created for them, the necessity to leave Moscow, St. Petersburg, go somewhere to the periphery and then to come back, uh, you're just really losing the perspective. I, I'm not saying that this narrative is invalid. It's totally valid and you can write a book uh, about this experience. But at the same time, you need to see a larger picture. These people are implanted in Soviet system. It's not their choice. They became, uh, how was to say? They, 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 they were, they're not conscripts. Conscripts to modernity, that was the title of the book about it, from Spot, right? So they, they were not conscripts, but eventually we need to think about them as the imperial elite this is just residing on this enormous edifice, which cannot be described by Foucauldian models, by the way, and uh, which, uh, for which we need to come up with a more multifaceted and refined narrative. I hear a, I hear a point that is not fully formulated. That there is a question about, um, you know, really the fundamental discontinuity 
of uh, uh, the Latin intelligence and uh, um, uh, and, and all these you know, specialists of the speaking medieval from the late imperial period to the present, you know, they represented both different social bases. You know, I imagine uh, at some point, uh, you know, from from these late imperial intellectuals, you know, many of the uh, much of that uh, uh, elite changed to in the direction of workers and peasants intelligentsia, yeah. who uh, who some of whom became faculty or um, or this uh, uh, you know Jewish way that uh, uh, you were asking so so long to write back to the Moscow. Um, so so how does this this continuity um, both socially but also you know the rise and fall of disciplines and the uh, changing of someone uh, how does uh, your model account for this discontinuity you seem to be making a, an opposite claim that uh, fundamentally uh, you know whether the project of medieval studies in Russia was, was fundamentally and constantly an imperial one despite all the Ups and downs that to suggest. Yeah, thank you, Rosen. That's a very good question. Uh, so I will have opportunity to clarify some things. So <clears throat> it definitely was imperial. And the point is that uh, this imperialism refers to different types of imperial formation. So basically, when we think about Russia and we call Russia empire doesn't mean that Russia is always a power in the same way. Russia empire in 17th century and 18th and 19th century. And Soviet Union is an empire. The, the point is to show that actually complete dislocation of elites. And you write, I didn't talk even about it. The, the guy, the medieval, medievalists and the experts that I was talking about before the revolution, they all recruited from the middle class, noble, Slavic families. There is not a single Jew among them before the revolution, not surprising. And then this elite is completely uprooted and you have a new cycle, new recruitment, but both the principles of recruitment that I try to show and the results uh, referring to completely a different imperial constellation. So, and that's the question of how empire reinventing itself and reconstituting itself uh, on a new ground. So it can say, Nothing has changed. And I think this description quite accurately uh, um, captures what happened actually there. It's a different type of empire, Soviet empire. And people still grappling with this question. I think just this imperial perspective, which helps to re-narrate and reconsider the central narrative of Russian Soviet history, right? We need a certain sensitivity to the empire to think about Zhivago's children as well, and to think about the all representatives of this Occidentalist complex. Yeah. Um, thank you, first of all, for this super rich and fascinating talk. And I'm sorry to be asking about the prevalence of the peripheral others in Soviet high places. But I did just, I, I love this framing of, of that break, but I am just wondering, like, why is it that the, that having the other in a position of power was so important to the early Soviet regime? Is it about, like, some kind of social capital or moral authority? Or is it instead, like, a way to just alienate, um, power from the masses or something else? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question because actually uh, I don't think that there was any intention. Mm -hmm. So uh, before 1917, there is, as I know, no Jews at all. In the practice, some of them, and it's actually fascinating to read some accounts, but these professors who still arrived in the positions in the late 1920s, who are described in the literature as philosemitic, and they basically describing the assault of this new proletariat 
not in terms of class analysis, it's proletarian Jews attacking us. So these subalterns for whom we already, we gave them a timeline, and this Vinogradov's timeline, you, you have to wait before you will move to, to the center. And it's just abruptly, abruptly happening. And so I don't think that there is specific intention in doing this. And, but there, it's not accidental that Jews basically not selected, but they happen to be there. And that's my point about that each nationality, and they basically reorganizing it in 1930, is getting their own home. Eric Scott's book about diasporas, right? It's diasporas that you can see in Moscow, but each diaspora had a place to go. Jews don't have place to go. And they basically, uh, uh, what Yuri Slyoskin is writing, they embrace the project of modernity. Some of them were lucky because the huge difference between Jew in Soviet Union and Moscow were with Jew in these institutions and some Jew in Zhitomir. Or oh, some Jew in some in Belarus. So it's not about ethnicity. In the context of Belarus and Ukraine, there is no other. Another guy, Jewish, probably they will make some jokes about him, but that's it. But the connection between ethnicity and this proximity to the ideal West, which is basically constructed, the decoration, you can say it's Potemkin village, but Potemkin village is the size of the city, which has enormous consequences for the whole organization of space, imperial space in Soviet context. So uh, definitely I didn't find any intention, but at a certain point, they start describing them as other, and this Jewish label just fits very well. And so we're actually thinking about these late Stalinist campaigns and anti-Semitism and the rise of Russian nationalists, we need to uh, try to combine these two things. Because they're constantly referring to this otherness, and it's interesting when this representatives of elite, as I mentioned, went to the peripheries during the war, and they feel these anti-Semitic attitudes of the hinterland population, which they describe completely colonially. It's like this native, I don't know, uncultured rush, Polynesian almost. There, there is one quotation from the. So they're making these parallels for themselves. And, and themselves, they are Jews who are going to be, in five years, uh, completely demolished um, by, by this wave of anti-Semitism. So definitely no intention. It's just weird things that happened there. And I, I, I tried to problematize it, how we will talk about it. Because there is a separate Jewish narrative about Jewish history and Soviet Jews. I think we need to bring them back into the wider picture. Yeah, so yeah, find so much time, but yeah, I guess I wanted to comment on your last point on the fact that there was no intention, right? There was no intention of dividing people into like categories, nationalities, etc. Right? Like part of the like imperial, like Soviet imperial colonial project was you know anti-colonial like basis of it or anti-imperial basis of it that was you know a particular history. That probably like your project could you know tell more about could take into account because I haven't like in the talk that um, it, you presented right that you've given I guess yeah it could help if if you would tell more about the like the anti-colonial imperial anti-colonial history of, of the Soviet socialism like to phrase it this way in, yeah. is it clear yeah, yeah like but, imperial anti-colonial yeah. Oh, yes. imperial anti-colonial. Right. Do you understand what, what I'm talking about? Uh, maybe you could try try harder. <laughs> so uh, I, I got the first uh, question about the national boxes. Actually, I didn't try to say that it was unintentional. The intentional building nationalities. <laughs> it would be very stupid for me to say that. Affirmative action empire eventually. Right. I'm saying that. Uh, uh, the, the importance of culture for this project and desire to showcase the superiority of Soviet project eventually creates conditions when these distinctions, national distinctions, are rearranged and organized in a specific way, leaving empty a national space in the center. And the Jews just happen to be there, and it's nice 
uh, nice way to basically to mark this place as, as, as a national place of otherness, which very important for the foundation of, of the whole Soviet project. To the very end, regardless of the nationalism, rise of nationalists, it's internationalist, it's socialist, it should be different. And it, this difference had to be displayed and always had to be on spot. And Moscow to the very end basically fulfilling uh, this role. I didn't get the point about imperial anti-colonialism. No, you're, you're going there, like you're, you're, they, they answer the, 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 because uh, the people that I'm talking about, this occidentalist elite, this is the last thing that they would uh, talk about of themselves, the imperial. Because they are anti-statist, mm -hmm. they anti-Russian national, like anti-Russian nationalistic, communist, communistic kind of addition. Why? It's quite clear because we can show the narrative and we can show repressions. It's a narrative about late Stalinist campaigns and it can be re repressions in the late 60s uh, and further in the 70s. But the position and the importance of this elite in the construction of, of this Soviet imperial building, it's totally missing. And you know, it's not only, I can talk not only about medievalists, right? We can talk because let's say Russian high culture operates almost in a similar register because Russian imperial culture, it's almost kind of Western culture. And what Yuri Lotman, let's say, doing in Tartu, exploring the 19th century and uncovering this noble Russian culture, which is quite different from the very cosmopolitan, right? Uh, culture. It's it's basically uh, a similar process, right? It's ideal West, which is realized in Russia, because in a certain way, this Russian noble, it, in a condensed way, uh, displays the most refined qualities of the European culture and cosmopolitan culture. So we're going back to Vinograda, who is telling that the yeah, Russian educated class is the most advanced and it's, it's mission to overcome the distinctions and divisions within the European um, intellectual culture. That's the point. Russian is universal and the sense that they can represent uh, Western ideal modality. your project then leave more space for Soviet anti-imperialism, uh, anti anti-colonialism, you know, this much more straightforward um, view. It's, it's definitely it leaves. It, uh, it leaves. I'm just, uh, the framework of this project, regardless of what they say, and when I organize this, Symposium actually last uh, spring mm -hmm. about global socialism. Uh, I think one of the participants said that Soviets they wanted badly wanted to be the best anti imperialists when they came to Kazakhstan and to Central Asia. Despite the intentions, it just couldn't work and didn't work. Uh, it's not to deny the importance of these connections and attempts to organize anti-colonialism and to engage the third world. I think the, just the construction of the project, the foundations, how it was conceived, uh, would not allow to re-transform. It's a deeply occidentalic project with the idea of the nation, which had to be reorganized in a certain hierarchical fashion. And this recently I was fascinated reading um, one Ukrainian scholar who, wrote about uh, periodical sets and it's like universe in Ukrainian analog of inostranna literatura, uh, which was closed down in early 30s as it was this dynamic of closing down. It was reopened in the late 50s and in the 70s when it became kind of again cutting edge translating European literature, there was a clamp down on this attempt of Ukrainians and so these scholars are writing, and they start publishing and translating these progressive authors from the world. So you, you can see this deeply ingrained 
of internationalist feelings even among the people who are claiming post-colonial agenda or trying to think within uh, these terms. It's, it's, it's deeply contradictory. And I think even all these elites that I was talking about, Tajik intelligence, Uzbek intelligence, Kazakh intelligence, despite anti-imperialist moment, they deeply, deeply imbibe the, the structures uh, of this Occident-centric uh, perspective on the world. Thank you, Lovadia, for um, very intellectually intense experience that left me with, with so many more thoughts. Uh, and and uh, thank you to, to our Lovadia, both from the offline to um, kept for these two hours and uh, see you tomorrow actually at the next Jordan Center event.